Our drinking holiday is sadly almost at an end. Boo! In our quest to revise our view of Britain by looking well, at it through the bottom of a glass, we've been to North, way and the spectacular yeah. Scottish Isles. Hey, look at that! Whoa! Oh, ho, ho. That? And to Ireland, that... where James questioned my very ancestry. To be sure. You're not from Rubbish. Ireland, are you? Shut You've up! Made it up. It's based on auntie, postcards. Auntie, auntie. <laughs> Stop it! And back in England, Oz discovered his inner dancing queen. Hey! And took me to see some giant Welsh suntan lotion bottles. All in the hope of finding the drink that speaks for modern Britain. Have we come to a conclusion? Yes, we have. And the rather surprising conclusion is... Oz? Do you expect me to talk, May? No, Mr Clark. I expect you to drink. We're finishing where we started, in the southeast of England, which, not for the first time in its history, has become a battlefield. At stake this time is our freedom to drink proper beer and not be ground down by the iron-heeled jackboot of a ruthless invader. So-called sparkling wine. Oh, James, give it a chance. What a wonderful day. It's great, isn't it? Oh, this, this is vineyard weather, James. Now, all the way along it, look at that hill over there. That will be pure chalk. Chalk is the soil on which Champagne's greatest Grapes grow. The greatest, most beautiful, fresh, bright, vivacious, ex exciting, thrilling, exhilarating vines all grow on chalk. You're getting too effervescent. Ah, oh, well. I know. So Sorry, what are you saying? So this can be over. over. You are. You've popped your cork. Yeah. We're on our way to visit my old mate. Peter Hall, a wine pioneer who was one of the first people to grow grapes here on the Sussex Downs. Traitor. His vineyard, called Breaky Bottom, produces award-winning wines that have even been served in the British Embassy in Paris. Collaborator. The lovely thing about Peter is that he's a dreamer. What sort of wine does he make? He makes fabulous sparkling wine. Oh, God. What? Or well, have you ended up at the end of a marvellous trip around Britain, finding out all about the drinks of the British Isles? We end up back with cod French sparkling plonk. It is you know, not I don't like cod stuff. French sparkling plonk, James. This is a true original. He doesn't even use the champagne grapes for most of his stuff. Hang on. What? Risk of grounding. Risk of grounding. Yep. Risk of hurting. Ah, here it is. Breaky bottom. Breaky rear suspension, more like it. Peter! He's not there. There's yeah. one. Hello? I know, James, he's not in the pond. It's his very own. Hello? And then, evidence of Frenchness. Yeah. The baggy. Don't leave them alone. Baggy. Peter! There's his pants. Peter! That's revolting. What is <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. More evidence of Frenchness. It's a long time. It's ages. And you don't look a day older. <laughs> Not do you. That's your cue. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Not do you. Sir. This Sir. is James. James. How do you do? How do you do? This is my old friend Peter. Peter. No. Sir. Okay. Now tell me about the vines. How are they getting on? They're not ready yet. Oh. You shouldn't be eating that now. <sighs> That's all right. It's, a, it's an August. Good acid. They're a few days behind the other ones in. Yeah. This is like Cornwall. It's not going to be ready today, is it? No, it's no. not. But it is important. Uh, yeah, of course it is. It it's grapes. What's your view as a winemaker on standing around in vineyards talking about wine compared with, say, standing around a table drinking it? We can go right now and drink wine. I think that's that would that's... be a very good idea. OK. OK. Because you... Predictably, Peter and Oz have decided to torture me into telling them everything I know with a fizzy pop challenge. Okay, put all nine out. Okay. And, uh, James, go over there and count to a hundred. <laughs> Righto. <laughs> Here are nine sparkling wines from around the world. James is to choose his favourite. 
you know? Yes, that's good. That's Angel's good. kiss, I think. Yes, kiss. We'll stick to kiss. One of them is Peter's, which means James could embarrass me hideously. To ensure fair play, I'm carefully concealing the bottles from James's gaze. The sharp-eyed amongst you might recognise my dressing gown. Brilliant. Brilliant. Perfect. Perfect. You can come back. Right. You have nine sparkling wines. Which is your favourite wine? OK, quiet, please. OK. Yeah. First up for judgement, this one from Tasmania. Mm, good fruit. Not that much acidity, but a hint of citrus. But it's swiftly overtaken by a Californian sparkling wine made with French know-how. Hmm. I think that one's French. Now, an English sparkler enters the race, but not Peter's. A slightly more feral, almost beer-like quality to this one. Um, so this is the one you like least so far? Yes. Okay. Next, right. this is actually champagne. Small bubbles. It's light. It's light perspiration on somebody you like. That's a very good. That normally means Chardonnay. Mm. What will James make of Spanish Carver? This one's off. Am I right? Yeah. Now, Peter's wine. Do the right thing, James. Okay. Mm. OK, OK. Now, this is more like the sweat of an athlete. That one is more like, as you say, the gentle perspiration of someone you don't mind being very close to, which isn't very many people in my case. Mm. But is the sweat of an athlete better or worse? Not as good on the nose. Oh, no. Fatted. Yeah. So, so we're left with way. these front runners. It's the Californian sparkler and the French champagne. Similar colour. Pale. Silvery. Definite custardiness hint in that, sort of slight creaminess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I like that one. I think that is possibly a more sophisticated drink. A connoisseur would prefer that one. I like that one because it's simple. And which countries do they come from? California or England. France, I'd say. James, you're absolutely right. This one comes from California. Mm. And this one comes from France. Your tasting was rather fine. Thank you. My friend mm. Peter mm. is probably impressed. He'll be more impressed if I point so out something was. about his. Well, I feel obliged to be slightly diplomatic. But from what I know about wine, which is not a great deal, I think that would taste fantastic after five years in Aussie's secret basement. I think the balance of the acidity and the flavour is very good. Yeah. Um, and in five years' time, it will have got all that richness. This is what happens with sparkling wines when they're good. Uh, they get a rich, creamy, nutty, beautiful, honeyed, spicy quality. You can only do it by ageing the wine. I could open a bottle of 1999. Oh, fantastic. Yes, please. Yeah? Uh, yeah. I, I, because I agree with you. I'd what like a fine man Peter cat is. Cat. I'm I wish he made beer. It. Anyway, after overdoing it on faux French sophistication, we decide to have a pie. By the way, of cleaning a spatula. The pie is glazed with saliva. Does it need to be a, 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 a total seal? Yeah, well, I think it's better if it is, because then no juice escapes, and it all soaks into the potato, and then it's... Stout lady at the bit, moment. Push a bit over to all there and push it up and push it in. This is going to be lovely, James. Yeah, it is going to be bloody good. So it should be. It's taken uh, nearly three hours to make. <laughs> I'm cutting there. The pie will now go in the oven. Wow, look at that! That isn't a bad slice. Stop eating. Put, put the fork down just for a moment. No, I don't mind doing that. Look straight at the camera. I want one word, and it has to be the first word that comes into your head. Concentrating? Yep. Caravanning. Bollocks. Thank you. Next morning, it's another glorious summer's day, and we're off to Westrum in Kent, home of the traditional English hop garden. Suddenly, by the side of the road, we spot a beer maker who knows where one of them is. It's right here, James. Is that this him? Is, that's him. What do you think? Standing out in the middle of the road like this. 
Robert. Good afternoon. God. Mind the puddle. Puddle line, absolutely. This is James. This is Hello, Robert. James. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you. And you. Are you going to get in. the back? All the trouble. Uh, well, yep. Get past all the boxes. Sorry, it's not the tidiest car in the world, but yeah, yeah. it's got a lot of atmosphere in there. <laughs> Absolutely. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that Robert Wicks left a job in the city to start his own microbrewery. Inspired by no less a man than Winston Churchill, he set out to recreate the pint that saved Britain. Not that one. It's one of James's. We know from the archives of the old Black Eagle Brewery that they had uh, they filled the auxiliary fuel tanks of Spitfires at Biggin Hill flew them over to the troops after the Normandy landings in 1944 and sustained the troops with pale ale from the Black Eagle Brewery dropped in these auxiliary fuel tanks of the Spitfires. This sounds like my kind of beer, this, Oz. Absolutely. Well done. So would, would Western beers have been drunk in the mess at Biggin Hill Airfield? Yes, they were. In fact, most of the pubs in this area were owned by the old Black Eagle Brewery and they sold Western ales. So Fighter Command 11 Group, which Biggin Hill would have been a part, obviously defeated the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain. So what you're essentially saying is you're recreating the beer that saved Britain, well, indeed, saved civilization from the dark abyss, you know, lit with perverted science and all the rest of it, and took us onto the broad sunlit upland. Absolutely. Oh, I really want some of this beer. Well, we'll have to make sure we give you some before the end of today. Gee. Temporarily lost in a private Spitfire fantasy, I missed what the hitchhikers said about hop gardens. And when you say a hop garden, that is the technical term for a place where you grow hops, doesn't mean it's small and at the back of a house. No, it is. The reason they call them hop gardens is I understand that in days gone by, they were able to, if they call them gardens, they were able to escape certain forms of taxation. Park up here. We're going to visit one here at Scotney Castle, which turns out to be a farm. Ah, now. OK, let's see if we can find Ian. He's probably down there in the hop garden at the moment. Yes, I think I can see him spraying. We're looking for one of the few surviving hop growers in Kent, a man called Ian Strang. Are these horses dangerous? Like no, hop? I don't think so. Hello, horse. Do you like? Hello. Oh. Ooh, <sighs> losing your touch with the fillies, James. Shall I open the gate for you this time? Oh, Would you? Yes, Thank you. Anyway, hop growing has long been in decline, and where once there were <sighs> thousands of hop gardens, now there aren't. Cool. How about that? Look at that. What about that, James? So Have you ever seen one of these before? I haven't been this close to one. A hop garden. That's a hop garden. Yeah. Look at this. Here's Ian coming now. Ian Strang is Robert's partner in the beer business. He's, He's a farmer and tends to the hop vines with his traction engine. I hope he turns it off before it gets here. Turn the water off. Ah. Um, just now, did you say vines? Yes, they're called vines, not vines. Ian, how are you? So, that's a bind fact. And here's another one. Apparently, they're tricky buggers. So, the way you're describing this operation, it sounds like you've deliberately picked something that's very difficult to do. Well, there's a sense of sort of tradition, um, something that's dying out and needs preserving. I mean, um, is it dying out? Oz is always saying that yes, Kent in the olden days was just a complete sea of hops. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the investment to go into hops, to grow hops, is enormous. Why do you go on doing it? Uh, hope, I guess. It's certainly the case that if the microbreweries are going to continue to produce beers with character, that we're going to need the hops with character. That's why we're working to increase the acreage with the English varieties, because that's what uh, we're keen on using, and uh, a lot of the regional brewers are now wanting to refocus the provenance of their beers onto the local hops once again. This walking about is absolutely exhausting. Any chance of a pint? Can I try the beer that saved the world? Ah, the British Bulldog. Closest well, it's the closest we think we can get to that beer, yes. Here we go. Cheers. Mmm. That's a fighting beer, isn't it? Malty and mm, hoppy. See, I don't know what beer tasted like in the olden days, because I wasn't there, but that just tastes like a nice, strong, manly beer. Well, James, if it saved Britain, perhaps it can speak for Britain. It's a good beer. 
Can I have some more, please, sir? Yes, of course. <sighs> Congratulations, you two, brewer and hop grower. That's a rate good pint. It's proper beer, it's uncomplicated, it's honest, it's a pint. And you don't want nice to talk view, about the flavours. View of hops. And I bet in the old days there would have been hops as far as the eye could see. And they're all going to be taken over with vineyards making sparkling wine. We hope not. I hope not too. Now there's something I need to tell James. I've been meaning to tell him for some time, to be honest, but it's so difficult to find the right words. I hate to do this to him, but I can't put it off any longer. I just can't. There are rumours of French ownership. What? How much of it have they got? The rumours are that uh, one or two million pounds and maybe more has been spent on English farmland to plant with grapes for By the, the champagne French. people. Well, the champagne right. producers. Where's Nelson? Where's Wellington? Where's King Arthur? Funny you should mention the Duke of Wellington. He was technically an Irishman, like me, and England will again be saved by an Irishman. Mangy dog. And his dog, Noodles. Like yes. Dermot Sugru it's... and Noodles are going to take on the French at their own game. Uh... Sparkling wine, James. Hello, dog. Noodles. Nice. Oz, how are you? I'm all right. Great to see you. Great to see you. What you're looking at is one of the best equipped new wineries in the UK today. It may not look too, too fantastic outside, but let me show you what we've got going on inside. After you. Thank you. A winery in an old garage. Terroir sounds promising. This way. Here on the Whiston Estate in Sussex, Dermot is hoarding the very best in French technology du vin. I like all this stuff. Is Dermot is preparing for his first harvest, and upstairs is his pièce de résistance. Wow. Ah. <laughs> Where did you get that? Voici le pressoir. Oh. <laughs> it's a giant vintage champagne press. He's also imported from France. Are you using French things because the French are good at making this because they have a long tradition of it, or are you actually trying to be French? I'm not trying to be French. No way. When, when it comes to sparkling wine, it's unsurpassed in, the, in, the, in the, the rest of the world. We certainly don't have the ability to make things like this in England or any tradition of making things like this in England. This press is what has made champagne the drink that it is today, has given it the reputation that it has today because of the quality of the juice that it produces. Why, why is that so special? Because when you want to make sparkling wine, you need a better quality of juice. You need an extremely slow, gentle pressing cycle to remove the very best part of the juice out of the grapes. And you can only do this with a press, similar in, in design like this, very, very, very large surface pressing area and incredible pressure. Up to 100 tonnes of pressure this, this exerts but on the grape what juice. Do you mean by the, what do you mean by the, the best juice? If you take your typical grape, on the inside, this is the intermediate zone, this is the highest quality juice because it's high in acidity, it's high in sugar. Once you start to extract juice that's closer to the skins, then you get the properties of the skins. You get phenolic, bitter, tannic properties, which is no place in sparkling wines. This wine press is the only one of its kind in the country, so not surprisingly, Dermot's keen to show it off. Oh my God. <laughs> Check out this. That's, that's quite good, isn't it? So then these arms come out in order to keep them straight. And then we can start delivering by hydraulics the pressure. As a genuine Irishman, rather than one of these phony Irishmen we see so many of, have you ended up knowing so much about and being so interested in champagne? It seems slightly incongruous. Mm, yeah, maybe it is a little bit odd. I had a passion for wine, so I went to France, initially to Bordeaux, where I made red wine. And then in England, I started working at wineries which were making sparkling wine. And I realized the sheer potential of making sparkling wine in England. This is a great frontier. This is one of the greatest wine frontiers in the world today, sparkling wine in England. Now that Dermot has nicked France's wine press, all he needs to finish the job is some grapes. And Robert's your oncle. These vineyards will bear their first harvest this year, but up ahead lies Dermot's greatest discovery. Let me assure you, this is the single 
greatest vineyard sites I've come across. Where are the grapes? Come on, Lins. Come on. Damn it. Half with. What do you think of this? I see exactly what you mean. The bowl. Um, James, the whole thing about bowls is that so many of the great vineyards of the world, particularly in northern Europe, are in bowls in northern Italy, in Austria. Are you saying this is a perfect place to grow champagne grapes? Absolutely. This just ticks all of the boxes. If you had to, if you wrote a list of all the perfect parameters that you wanted in a vineyard, this has got them all. Chalk, slope, bowl-shaped, perfect aspect, perfect orientation, shelter from the prevailing winds. It is totally, totally awesome. So, so you, so you to... might have three or four sites like this on, on your own estate. Yeah. From Dover to Weymouth, there might be hundreds. Absolutely. Just yeah. At the moment, grazing sheep and growing... They're waiting to be found. This is, this is such a, a broad, expansive land all around the South Downs, all this chalk area, that, that, that the, the potential is, is, is mind-blowing, really. That's why the Champenois are coming. Ah. But I'll tell you this, if I was the head of a Champagne house and I had a limited area of production in Champagne, I'd certainly be looking at potential sites like this in the UK. But because you the rumor... You can't let the French buy great tracts of southern England and turn them into vineyards. This is why we must plant them ourselves. So basically, we, we've got to seize this opportunity before the French get hold of it. How much investment do you need? This field? To plant this field, you're looking at a quarter of a million pounds initially. Right. This is my chance to stop a little corner of England becoming a foreign field. Can I own a bit of it if I put some money in it? Absolutely. Be my guest. Could I choose the bit I owned? You can indeed. Because I quite like the look of that bit, where there's a little sort of dimple in it. Because that's like a bowl within a bowl. Can we go and have a look at that? That's quite a good I choice, actually. So, at the conclusion of our grand tour, I might end up owning a little bit of a vineyard in Sussex. And here's the really clever thing. I'm going to use it to plant beer. And so we find ourselves back where we began, on the white cliffs of Dover. Older, bolder, blotchier. Us, I mean, not the cliffs. So, James, what have you learned? Now, the object of the exercise was to find the drink that speaks for modern Britain. Uh -huh. Which one is it, then? Beer. Good, true, British, honest beer. I don't think it is. I mean, I love it. It's my favourite drink. But the problem is, it's been intellectualized it's become a boutique thing for connoisseurs it's not the default choice of everyday people anymore <laughs> how's that <laughs> that is great what now though taste? don't don't muck about what's the flavor in your mouth beer muscatel tea leaves from the high hills of darjeeling i think it's, it smells quite beery <laughs> yeah, i would say multi carol carol what but you say you say you'd say no, it, but you no, and it's called red diesel. You can't get any more Irish than laundered diesel. On the blanometer, it's quite high. But the Pontrin nettles. It tastes like beer. Oh, it smells of beer, James. You'd like that. Hey, go on then, drink it and <laughs> pontificate. If it is beer, I think you'd have to say, and you won't like this, that it's lager. We don't like that because it's fizzy, cold filth. And it's not an honest pint. What about Zoider then? Yeah. Here. Mm. Cider. Oh. <laughs> That's fighting cider there. Wah! Apple-based <laughs> drinks are the entire human condition, all its joy and all its misery, and our mortality. There you go. That's why it's good. This is singing cider. Where be Come that on. blackbird be? I know where he be. He be up your Mersel tree and I be out her e. Cider speaks for parts of Britain really well. Well, there you go, and that's hardly Britain, is it? That's bits of it. Then we're in trouble. What about Perry? Perry is a minority interest. You're the first man I've ever seen to hold a baby sham glass. I, I never... And not be thrown out of the pub. <laughs> C can you buy Perry like yours in a typical supermarket? No. There's just not enough pears in the country. Most people don't even know what Perry is. What about... what about... Whiskey? No, no, no. Whiskey divides Britain. I've got a few bottles and I save it as a treat. Very late at night when I'm feeling... philosophical... when I'm feeling, uh, Lonely. 
Lonely, yes, that's the word I was looking for. That is exceptionally exciting whiskey drink experience. And you're still an ugly bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not whiskey like, then? It's not whiskey. Vodka? Vodka's very popular. Gin? Gin, gin. Gin. Oh, sorry. Gin. Gin is a fantastic drink, but it is not the drink that speaks for modern Britain. Let's get to a really exactly. difficult one. And I know this is going to cause a bit of a row. Ah, wine. I don't believe it. <laughs> it's a vineyard in Yorkshire. <laughs> well, that's not right. It may not be right, but it's there, isn't it? Quintessentially English. It just absolutely reeks of the English countryside of this place. All the things I identify in it are the smells of the things that defined the British Isles. And they're there, rather absurdly, in a glass of wine. I don't know how long I've been trying your wines. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop sorry. spitting all over my shirt. And the fact is, the great wines of France will remain the great wines, I think, for a very long time. And that brings me you. rather neatly, and you'll like this, to this great conceit, English sparkling wine. Do you know why that isn't the drink that speaks for modern Britain? Why? Because champagne, because that's what it is, let's be honest, it is purely a status symbol, an expression of poshness. That's not champagne. That's British English sparkling wine. It's different. I don't think people in Britain are really that interested in drinking sparkling wine. So what have we got left? Dandelion and burdock? No, certainly not. Do you know what I think? I think there is one drink that genuinely invigorates this nation. It allows no hindrance to its enjoyment on the basis of, of class or race or education or income or geographical location. It gets things done. It's something that unites the people of this nation and it's something that other nations in the world simply don't get. There is one drink. Do you know what it is? Tea. Cup of tea. It's a cup of tea, isn't it? Cup of tea is the drink that speaks for modern Britain. Do you feel that like a cuppa? I'd love a cup of tea. Are you mashing? I'm mashing. Go on then. You up. Champion. Right. You can put Polly on. I will. Excellent. Ah. Look at that, that whole that whole cornucopia of drink in front of us, and what we really want is a cup of rosy. You got the milk? You got some milk earlier on. No, you got the milk. No, you were going to get some from the petrol station. No. All the time petrol. it takes to fill a Rolls Royce up with petrol, which is about two days, you had all that time to walk in through the door, pick up one pint of milk and pay for it, and you didn't do it. Oh, stop bleating. Anyway, where do you fancy going next? Who says I'm going away with you? Jilly Goulden might be free. You wouldn't. I might. <laughs>